I want to continue today talking about the theme of language. So I've chosen a reading from uh, Matthew's gospel that talks about a special form of language called parables. So it's uh, two excerpts from Matthew's gospel in chapter 13. The disciples came to Jesus and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Jesus spoke all of these things to the crowds in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Words inspired by God. How does a soul signify its arrival and its previous history as it's incarnating? I'll give you two examples from cultures that believe in some form of reincarnation. And the first culture is the Kalenjin people with whom I had the privilege of working for 14 years in the 70s and 80s. And um, when a little baby was born in the Kalenjin tribe, there were three different names given to the child. And you could tell when the child was born by the name that was given. Like if a little girl was called Chepkoech, I knew immediately she was born at dawn. If a little boy was called Kim Ngeno, I knew he was born when the, uh, the, the cattle were going out to the salt lake. Or if a little girl was called Cherubet, I knew she was born during a famine time. Or a little boy whose name was Kiprop, I knew he was born during the rainy season. And so the, one of the names was having to do with the actual circumstances of birth. But there was a much more important name, and that had to do with which of the ancestors was coming back to inhabit this new space suit. And so shortly after the little baby was born, they'd bring in one of the elders of the tribe who knew the ancestry of this little child. And the, uh, this uh, elder would begin naming the, the ancestors in chronological order. And when the little baby sneezed, they'd say, aha, that's the guy that's coming back. And so that was the signal that uh, one of the ancestors was coming back and was taking on a brand new space suit. So that's how the Kalenjin did it. So it's a form of language. It's a kind of vocalized language, or at least a sound language. The Inuit people of uh, the, what well, they're called the Eskimos sometimes, the Inuit people of Alaska had a different tradition. They too believed in reincarnation. And they believed that uh, the person who was dying would come back shortly into a new baby's body, a baby yet to be born. And so to identify uh, which baby was carrying the uh, genealogy or the reincarnation of a previous person, when the person was dying, they would take a piece of charcoal and make a mark somewhere on the dying person's body. And then for the next four or five years, they're watching which babies are being born and they're looking for a birthmark that corresponds in the same location, the same design as the charcoal mark that they put in it. And so this was indicating uh, the arrival or the re-arrival of an ancestor and the previous history of it. And so in some senses, there are two forms of language. So for the Kalenjin, it was like a vocalized form of language. And for the Inuit, it was a written or a drawn form of language. And so last week I began a discussion on the notion of language. And I'm gonna continue that discussion today with God's help. So last Sunday I copied, I uh, dealt with five different aspects of language. Firstly, I talked about the evolution of language itself over human history. And then I zeroed in on the theory of a Swiss linguist called Ferdinand de Saussure. I spent some time talking about his theory. 
And then he moved on to the story of the, the Tower of Babel, where God allegedly confused our tongues. And that led me into a discussion of what I consider to be two very different forms of telepathy. And then finally, I wound up, how does language then help us to create our reality models? So that's where I went last Sunday. So I want to continue that discussion today, and I'm going to pick up in four uh, topics aligned with that. Firstly, I want to talk about mysticism. And then I want to talk about um, ritual, the language of a community. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about parables, our proverbs and stories, they're all together. And then finally, I'm going to talk about naming ceremonies. So that's where I got today with God's help. And in order to begin a discussion of mysticism, I need very, very briefly to recap what I said last Sunday about this asur, and also a little bit about uh, telepathy. That'll contextualize what I mean by mysticism. So very, very briefly, last week I talked about Ferdinand de Saussure, a Swiss linguist, born in the uh, 1800s as well, uh, who had a theory of spoken language where he believed that it consisted of three parts. There's the referent, the thing in the real world that you're trying to describe, like, for instance, an elephant in the bush. And then secondly, what he called the signified, the image you carry inside your head, which can be part auditory, part visual, part olfactory, part tactile, but you're carrying an image of the elephant in your head. He called that the signified. And then you want to tell the other people what you just saw, and then you're going to use signifiers or words. So there's the real thing, the referent, then there's the image, the signified, and then finally, there's the signifier, the words you're going to use. But I pointed out that there are problems with, with this theory. Uh, firstly, you have no guarantee that the signifiers you're using, the words you're using are understood by the listeners in the very same way as you, the speaker. So that's the problem with the signifiers. And there's also a problem with the signified, the images you're carrying inside your head, because there's absolutely no guarantee that the image you're forming in your head actually corresponds one-to-one -one with what's out there, because what's out there is electromagnetic signals that break down into binary mathematics, Boolean algebra. And you're interpreting that somehow as the image in your head. In philosophy, that's called the myth of the given, the fallacy that would make you believe that the outside world actually corresponds with your internal image of it. So that's the problem with the Sassur's model as far as I'm concerned. And then even telepathy has issues because telepathy is the ability to transfer my signifieds into your head. So I'm not, I'm not using language at all. I'm not using any signifiers. So at least I get away from the problem of the meaning of what I'm saying. So now I'm transferring, I'm downloading the signified from my head to your head. But even that form of telepathy has the very same problem of the myth of the given, because the signified, the image in my head, may not correspond at all with the reference out in the real world. So I suggest that there may be a higher form of telepathy in which we're sending reference to each other, not just sending signifieds to each other. So I'm not transferring an image in my head to you through this form of telepathy. I'm somehow managing to transfer the referent in the real world directly to you without ever using signified or signifiers. And I went on to claim that that may well be the difficulty that people who have near-death experiences when they're trying to communicate to us what the experience was because the signifiers are inadequate and even the signifieds are inadequate. And I believe that's, uh, that's the language of extra dimensionals and angelic beings, that they're, they're dealing with reference, they're not dealing with images of or signifiers for. So now with that background, I can launch into a discussion of what I think mysticism is. So I'm going to differentiate between two forms of mysticism. The first one I'm going to call elementary mysticism, which is basically source in conversation with the soul. So that's elementary mysticism, where there is source, God herself, you know, having a, a conversation with an individual soul. Now, um, in this sense, then, it's a slider. And enlightenment or mysticism is not an on-off. It's not binary. You're either, you're either mystic or you're not a mystic. It's more like a slider in your light system where you, you slide up the luminosity of the bulbs in your room. So that's what mysticism is like as well. And so even elementary mysticism is inarticulatable because there are no signifiers capable of speaking it. Whatever words you employ will be radically inadequate. 
And so even with elementary mysticism, you can't use words to communicate it. It is ineffable, it is inarticulatable. Now, full enlightenment, when you slide it all the ways up, I believe, is that you're being had by the experience. You're not having an experience, you're being had by the experience in which there are not even reference because it's basically an internal dialogue that God is having with herself. So there's no need for signifiers, for signifieds, or even for the reference themselves. It's basically an internal dialogue that God is having with herself. So if I were to look at mysticism like in the sliding scale of five different levels of language, I would say that ordinary language uh, employs reference, things in the real world, and then signifies the image we carry in our heads, and then finally signifiers that we try to communicate with. So there's three elements to kind of ordinary language. The real thing out there, the image in my head, and then the language I use to try to communicate it. Telepathy is the next stage, because telepathy has reference in the real world and has signifieds in my brain, but I don't need to employ signifiers at all. I can communicate the signifieds directly from my brain to your brain. That would be stage two of the slider. Stage three then is mysticism. And so mysticism has reference, but has neither signifieds nor signifiers. It doesn't use language and it doesn't have images, but there are reference, which somehow it's experiencing. That'll be stage, four, stage three. Stage four then I would call unity consciousness. And unity consciousness doesn't have even reference. There's no referent, there's no signified, and there's no signifier when you're at unity consciousness because it's God's internal dialogue. And then the final stage, full enlightenment, is the permanent identification with that state of consciousness or the permanent identification with source. So just very briefly, that's my hit on mysticism. So now I want to look at a, another form of language, ritual which in some senses is dramatized language. And when I look at the phenomenal world around me, I see that vocalizations are the language of animals. Words are the language of human beings. Rituals are the language of communities. And silence is the language of the mystics. And so there's all these different kinds of languages as well. So I'm gonna zero in for a few moments now on ritual. And I believe that uh, a ritual is the multi-sensory, multi-modality expression of an entire community. It's not just an individual person speaking. It is a community articulating itself in some kind of a dramatic form. And it's multi-sensory. It's appealing to all the senses and it's multi-modality. There can be music attached to it. There can be uh, visuals attached to it. And so, you know, um, to pick up on a, uh, a simple example, uh, pretty much everything we do in life is ritual. You go to a ball game, James Moran is looking at the 49ers playing today. If you attend the 49ers game today, you're looking at a ritual. Every ball game is the ritual. So there's chanting goes on, each group has their own song, and you know who's for playing for, for whom team. There are the vestments, the special vestments that the players are wearing, their uniforms and their helmets and their padding or whatever. So special uh, vestments that they're wearing. There are special rules or protocols to this particular liturgy, things you can do and things you can't do. And there are yellow flags being thrown down when the referees intervene. There's even a communion service. You can call it the kind of the, um, the, the tailgate party before the ball begin, begins or the hot dogs and beer that are served during the game. But basically a ball game is a ritual. So pretty much everything a community does together is some form of ritual. We do it in our daily greetings, even if it's kind of vestigial at this stage. So when you see, when I grew up as a little kid, every man who met any woman on the street would doff his hat. Now, this was a ritual going way back to the time when knights wore uh, their suit of armor and they had these visors that covered their faces. So when a knight came into town, you had no idea, was he a good guy or a bad guy, an enemy or a friend? So what did he do? He pulled up his visor so you could see his face. So that's the vestiges, you take off your hat, doff it uh, to a lady. So for instance, you look at um, a handshake. So typically when you shake hands with somebody, you offer your right hand because 90% of the world's population are right-handed. And it's in your right hand, you'll be carrying a weapon. Now, if you're a left-hander, they're gonna call you sinister. The word for, in Latin for the left is sinister. In French is gauche, it's like something wrong with it. 
And so, and the reason is this, an enemy could come in and shake hands with you and extend his right hand. But if he's a kyotog, in Irish we call a kyotog, a left-hander, if he's a kyotog and he reaches your right hand, in his case, it's not his weapon hand, he could be holding a dagger behind his back and stabbing you in the heart. And so to show that you're a real friend, you extend your, your, your weapon arm and say, look, it's empty. That's the origin of a handshake. And we have we hug people and we kiss people. And so there are daily rituals that we engage with as, 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 as in relationship. Now, even the animals uh, have shown us how to do this. There are animal mating rituals, for instance. The animals dance in a particular fashion, particularly birds. And the feathers and the colors of the feathers are vitally important to distinguish the good guy who's good for breeding and the guy who isn't. And there, there are pheromones or there's olfactory signals that are coming out. And then there are the sounds that they make. So you watch animals mating behavior and it's beautifully orchestrated ritual. Now I want to focus on one particular kind of ritual today. And it's the ritual of Catholic Eucharist. Particularly when there was a high mass you know, in a Gothic uh, cathedral. And as I said, good ritual is multimodality and is multisensory. And so you take the, the high mass, if any of you are old enough to remember a high mass in a cathedral. So there's a visual uh, impression given. Particular vestments that the priest is wearing, there'll be different colors for different seasons. And there'll be stained glass windows that you can look at visually. And there'll be the architecture of the building itself. And then there'll be, you know, the, um, uh, the statues that you find around the place. All of them cluing you into a kind of an altered state. And then there's the olfactory sense. They're using incense. They're swinging the thurible. And you can see the incense permeates the entire church. So you're having an olfactory encounter. And then movement itself is employed. So the priest is going to use different kinds of gestures. He's going to make the blessings, holding his hands in various, various forms. And he's going to bow. And he's going to genuflect. And so movement is part of this ritual. Even taste is. The taste of the bread and the taste of the wine. And touch is. You're going to offer the sign of peace to other people in the church. So liturgy is, is a very uh, important form of a ritual. Now, within that context and within the Roman Catholic version particularly, you have three levels permeating it. What I call signs, symbols, and sacraments. And a sign is one physical object standing for another physical object. So when you're driving along the road and you see a sign, you know, green with white paint on it, you know, indicating that there is an off-ramp coming up. So basically, it's a piece of metal with paint pointing to a piece of tarmacadam. That's a sign. So it's one physical thing standing for another physical thing. Now, a symbol is different. A symbol has one foot in physicality and one foot in the metaphysical. And so, for instance, a kiss is not just a sign, it's a symbol. So physiologically, it represents two sets of lips meeting each other. So that's the physical component. The metaphysical component is, I love you, you know, I respect you. And so there's one leg in metaphysical, one leg in physical. That's a, that's a symbol. And then a sacrament is a particular kind of symbol. It's a symbol that actualizes that which it signifies. It causes to come about that which it symbolizes. And this is a very important distinction because signs can be made to tell lies. You can take a road right sign and turn it around 90 degrees and everybody who reads the sign is gonna get lost. So signs can tell lies. Even symbols can be made to lie. So Judas uses the symbol of a kiss to betray Jesus. So signs can tell lies, symbols can tell lies, but real sacraments cannot tell a lie. Because a real sacrament is, sacraments happen when the liturgical symbols create an altered state of consciousness that allow you to select out reality by your attention and your intention. So I've given this example before. If I'm dispensing communion in a church and a young kid comes up with a piece of chewing gum in his mouth and his two hands in his pocket and he goes, he sticks out his tongue and I put a piece of bread in his tongue. Was that a sacrament? Absolutely not. That kid is just mixing chewing gum with bread and he goes back to his seat. That's all that happened. So another person comes up and very, very reverently, you know, they're obviously in an altered state of consciousness and they put their tongue out and I put a piece of bread on it. And what happens is there's a shift in consciousness. Now a real sacrament has taken place. It's not an empty symbol anymore because it's the mindset of the person receiving it 
and it's the liturgical kind of a ritual that together is creating the dance, leading to an altered state of consciousness that allow you then to select out the reality of your choice by your attention and your intention. So that's what I would say about ritual today. We speak then about parables, and I would include in this uh, proverbs and stories as well. So many, many years ago, I invented two new terms. One of them I called mysticist, and the other I called mythish. Now, a mysticist, in my opinion, is what happens when a very advanced soul, uh, what I would call a polymath, has learned to be very conversant with physical, the physical sciences and also with mystical experiences. And so it's a combination of mystic and physicist. You put these together and you get a mysticist. And I believe that that's the future of humanity, that there are beings coming among us eventually who will be both conversant with, you know, and uh, up to date on the latest uh, science and physics in particular, and also with mystical states. And I would call people like Tyler de Chardin would be such people. So I call those mysticists. And then I created this word, I call it mythish, because I see language dividing into two different huge sections. There is exoteric language and there is esoteric language. So exoteric language is a kind of a fundamentalist scientism. It's not real science, it's scientism. So exoteric language is kind of fundamentalist scientism. Esoteric is very different. Esoteric gives birth to mythish. And mythish is a sacred form of language which unfortunately fundamentalists reduce to literalism and scientism regards as gibberish. And for, so for those who don't speak mythish, you know, uh, the, the, the Bible people among us who don't speak mythish are going to take the revealed word of God and create literalism out of it. And the atheists, the scientific atheists, are going to regard it as gibberish. Now, you can't really tie spiritual teaching to dictionary defined language. You cannot articulate, you know, spiritual teaching with philosophical concepts or with theological theories or even scientific terminology. It's a doomed exercise if you do that. It's like putting all of your food in a fridge that you forgot to plug in. The food is going to spoil. Because every time you articulate something in philosophical terms, theological terms, scientific terms, all those terms are going to change their meaning eventually. And they wind up meaning not what they meant originally and sometimes even the very opposite of what they intended to mean. And I give you the example a few, a few weeks ago about the notion of transubstantiation. This word that the Council of Trent in 1546 used to tell you what happens at the consecration when the priest takes bread and wine and converts them into the body and blood of Jesus. And the word they used was transubstantiation. The problem is the word substantia in Latin in 1546 means exactly the opposite of what it means in 2022. Substantia meant the essence of something. And transubstantiation meant the essence of it is changing at the consecration because of the mindset you know, of the celebrant and the community. Now, unfortunately, we get stuck with a term that today means transubstantiation would suggest that at the moment of consecration, the bread and the, and the, and the wine become the body and blood of Jesus. So during communion, you're eating Jesus' tendon and toenails or you're getting a blood transfusion when you drink out of the chalice. That's what it would appear to mean. And of course, that's complete mishigas. So they tried different terms. They tried using trans-essentialization and even trans-signification, signification, but none of them stuck. So now we have a word, you know, which means the opposite. So they put this word into a fridge that they for forgot to plug in and the food spoiled. So in other words, to understand then the use of parables. I've defined knowledge many times that Knowledge is information which is generated by the senses and processed by the brain. Whereas wisdom is information that's generated by the soul and processed by the heart. They're very, very different. Knowledge and wisdom are very, very different. And therefore, for me, truth is not factual. Something can be true, but not fact. And something can be fact, but not true. So truth is that which transforms me and aligns me with God. So with that understanding then of the difference between knowledge and wisdom and what truth is, for me then, mythish is a sacred, secret language. In fact, it is the true wisdom of a culture being archived and transmitted. That's what I mean when I say mythish. And you need to speak mythish in order to understand Jesus. If you don't speak mythish, you don't understand mythish, you don't understand Jesus. And that's why I chose the 
the passage today. Jesus is saying, they hear, but they don't understand. They see, but they don't comprehend. So in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is accosted on two occasions by interlocutors who want to know, why are you always talking these crazy parables? Speak to us plainly. Speak theology to us, or speak philosophy to us, or speak science to us. And he gives two totally different answers. The first time he says, I speak in parables so that seeing you may see, but not understand. Hearing you may hear, but not comprehend. And the reason is you don't speak Mithish. You know, you're taking out of the fridge food, which you placed there years and years before, and it's spoiled, and you're going to poison yourself with it. And the second time he was asked, he said, I speak in parables so that I may reveal things which have been hidden since the foundation of the world. So there are some truths which are so deep, science can't grok it, theology can't grok it, philosophy can't grok it, and ordinary language cannot grok it. Only mythish can reveal those kinds of truths. So it becomes really, really important that we learn to understand and to speak mythish. And finally, I want to talk about naming ceremonies. So by naming, I don't mean just hanging an identity tag on somebody you know, at a baptism ceremony. Uh, naming is much, much deeper than that. So, for instance, in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, after God had created all life, a marine life, you know, or, ornithological life, um, human life, he gave Adam and Eve the, the, the chance to name all of the critters. And they bring everyone in, and Adam and Eve give names to each of the beings. Now, it wasn't just they were hanging identity tags and saying, the guy there with the, the long proboscis and the two ties, how are we going to call him? Um, <clears throat> Butter? No. How about uh, kitty cat? No, no. Doesn't suit. How about um, elephant? Oh, let's call him elephant. That is not what was happening there. Adam and Eve were asked to come into an understanding of the essence of the beings with whom they shared the Garden of Eden. And naming means being in contact and relationship with the essence of the other. That's what it means to give name to. It's not identity tags. And when I look at having lived near the Maasai in Kenya of, of many years, every Maasai knew the name of every single one of his cows and his cattle, every single one. Now you take a modern farmer with his cows in a huge big feedlot with identity tags stapled onto their ears. That's the relationship they have. Or you look at Jesus' parable of the good shepherd. He leads the sheep. He doesn't drive the sheep. He walks ahead of him. They recognize who it is and they follow him. An obvious scenario, particularly down in Australia, unfortunately, where they're herding sheep by helicopter, literally. They've got helicopters flying over the big flocks and they're herding them into pins. They have no idea of the individuals involved in it. So naming has to do with being in a relationship with the essence of the other. Now, the only problem with naming at that level is that naming something also gives you power over the other. If you know the name of the other, you have some kind of power over it. And this is why God refuses to divulge his name to Moses. In the great story, I think it's in Exodus chapter three, where um, God wants Moses to go back into Egypt to set the Israelites free. And Moses wanted for murder already in Egypt. And finally Moses says, I, I, don't, I don't even know who you are. Who are you? And God says in Hebrew, Ehiye Ashir Ehiye, which is always mistranslated as I am who I am. There is no present tense of the verb to be in Hebrew as there isn't in a Kalenjin. You have to get around by a device called predication without a verb. And so God did not say, I am who I am. What he said, he used a future tense. Ehia, I should ehia, literally means, I will be who I will be. In other words, whatever the occasion calls for, that's how I'll show up. So it becomes very, very important that when you know somebody's name, you have some kind of power over the other. But when you really know your own real name, then you understand who you are and you understand what your purpose and what your mission is. And I suggested many times to you that the last thing that grandmother God says to you as you wing your way into incarnation is to sing to you your sacred, secret name. And when you can hear that, you understand who you are and you understand what your purpose is in volunteering for incarnation. So I want to end with this great story from, it's in John's Gospel in chapter 20. It's um, the day of resurrection. And Mary of Magdala has rushed to the tomb to try to you know, anoint the body of her dead um, companion. And she finds that the grave is empty. 
And there are two young men, angels, and saying to her, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And then she looks around, and there's somebody behind her, and the sun is shining in her eyes, you know, and she's been crying, diffracting her vision, and this being stands behind her, and she thinks it's the gardener. So she says, sir, if you've taken the body, can you please let me know where you put it, and I'll come and I'll remove it. And then Christ speaks one word. Miriamu. Except that's a very poor translation of what actually happened. He didn't speak Miriamu. He sang to her her secret, sacred name. And then Mary recognized who she was. She recognized what her mission was. She recognized who he was. And she recognized what his mission was. Namaste, my brothers and sisters.